Ladies and gentlemen, I am Yusuf. The game is World of Warships, and this is my review of the latest steel ship and the first steel carrier to enter the game. Meet the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt CV-42. Rosie, to borrow one of her historical nicknames, was the second of three Midway-class carriers built to augment the Essex Swarm, although she didn't actually start with the FDR name. At her launch on the 29th of April 1945, she was named the USS Coral Sea. But this lasted all of eight days before President Truman approved a recommendation from the Secretary of the Navy to change the name to the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt in honor of the preceding president who had died on the 12th of April that year. And thus started the US Navy's tradition of naming carriers after former presidents and the occasional admiral. The USS Coral Sea name incidentally went to the third ship of the class. The Roosevelt commissioned in October 1945, missing out on the Second World War, but went on to have a 32-year career, pick up a battle star in Vietnam before being decommissioned in 1977 and scrapped in 1978. All that survives is a 5-inch gun preserved at the White Sands missile range. In game, we have the FDR more or less as she was in 1945, with the open bow and the straight flight deck. Unsurprisingly, the hull stats are very similar to her tech tree sister, the Midway. They have the same armor layout, most notably including an 87 mm armored deck that will make her surprisingly resistant to long range high explosive fire, especially if destroyers decide to get themselves a little bit of revenge, as well as a torpedo protection of 25% and a 67,000 600 hit point total that rises to 71,100 with survivability expert fitted. Please note that that is not so much for the ship as it is for the planes, but we'll get to those in a moment. The ships also share the same absolutely terrible base detection of 15.4 kilometers. Secondary armor is slightly weaker than the Midway. Both ships use the 127 millimeter stroke 54 caliber gun firing an 1800 damage high explosive shell out to five kilometers every four seconds. Midway gets 18 of them, FDR makes do with 14. Maneuverability is again, almost identical. Top speed is 33 knots, turning radius 1,230 meters for both carrier. FDR apparently got slightly less ketamine, however, because she shifts the rudder in 17.3 seconds, where Midway needs 18.2 to get the rudder across and get into a turn. Not that too much weight should be attached to those stats, since if you're firing secondaries and trying to torpedo beat in a tier 10 carrier, the game was probably irretrievably broken at five minutes ago. And yes, that applies even if your carrier is called Richthofen, as amusing as deploying the battle star might be. FDR's flak is also slightly different. She gets eight puffs that do a total of 1610 damage per explosion at 3.5 and 6 kilometers. Continuous damage starts at the 6 kilometer mark at 175 per second, hit probability 100%. Mid-range kicks in at 3.5 kilometers, 539 DPS, again hit rate of 100%, and close range consists of a total of 112 DPS. So the weighting is more to mid-range than Midway's Ehrlich and Heavy setup, and it might surprise the occasional sniping a courier pilot, but conventional logic says attacking an enemy carrier with planes is usually just a quick way to lose planes. And I'm honestly not sure most hostile carrier drivers will appreciate the finer points of precisely when their planes go boom should they try it. Which brings us to the air wing. At first glance, it looks conventional enough. High explosive rockets, high explosive bombers and torpedo bombers, all courtesy of the Douglas TB2D Sky Pirate, which was actually a thing, sort of. There were two prototype Sky Pirates built for flight trials, but the project was scrapped with the end of the Second World War. Once you get into the air, though, it's immediately obvious that FDR works differently in a number of very important ways. Firstly, these planes are slow. I suspect that wheelchair memes of dubious taste will be circulating within the month, but for the moment it's enough to note that, out of the box, 
The rocket planes cruise at 124 knots with a dash speed of 164, while the torpedo and technically their dive bombers cruise at 119 knots and dash at 154. These are the slowest planes in the tier by about 20 knots. Audacious's Wyverns cruise in the 140s, and it's probably best not to compare them with Rechthofen's 170 knot plus speed demons, which I just did. Whoops. As far as weapons go, it's the standard US fare. The HE bomb is the ANM 66 found on the Saipan and the Midway. The rocket is the 127mm HVAR, with which so many destroyer drivers are so, so familiar. And while the Mark 7D torpedo is new, it's basically a weaker version of the Mark 7 Mod 1 found on Midway. 4,233 damage compared to the 5,000 and change on Midway 7 Mod 1, and it runs for 35 knots for 4 kilometers as standard. So, slow planes, unremarkable ordnance, and a hull that's barely distinguishable from the Midway. What's the secret source? Well, there are a few things. Firstly, the Sky Pirates are slow, but they're also incredibly tough. The rocket planes get 3,200 base health per plane. The torpedo bombers get 3,690, and the regular bombers come in at 3,710. Add on survival expert for another 250 health, aircraft armor to reduce incoming continuous damage by 10%, and maybe the relevant upgrade modules for I think it's another 10%, and you have planes coming in at close on 4,500 effective HP or more, as long as you can dodge the cotton wool of doom. This is significantly more punishment, on the order of twice some of the weaker planes, as most tier 10 aircraft can soak up. The Sky Pirates might not get a heal, but most of the time they don't really need it, although a Holland opening up on you at 3 kilometers with defensive fire is still a significant emotional event for your air crew. The other thing of note is that while the ordnance may be average, the sheer quantity that the Sky Pirates throw around is not. Each plane can carry four torpedoes, or four bombs, or a jaw-dropping 26 rockets. Attacks are made in pairs, so each attack pass will see eight torpedoes, eight bombs, or 52 rockets launched towards the target. And since you get 14 aircraft in a full strength launch, the transit from carrier to attack might be slow, but it won't necessarily happen nearly as often as with the other carriers. It's funny how fast the ship can go from looking bleh to looking like, I am death, the destroyer of boats. And in fairness, the prospect of an air wing rolling in with variously 56 torpedoes, 56,000 pound bombs, or 364 five inch rockets is a rather sobering one. So, of course, there's a catch. Several catches, in fact. First and most obvious is the whopping 25 second cooldown after an attack pass. Every carrier has a short 3, 4, 5 second cooldown after its attack runs, but normally that's just enough time to let the attacking wave peel off and give the rest of the squadron and your camera a few seconds to sort themselves out for the next attack run. With FDR's planes, the usual technique of immediately snapping back for a second run onto a target simply does not work. Combo torque drops? Forget them. Immediate follow-on fires after an ill-advised damage control on your first pass? Nope, not happening. The best option with FDR planes after an attack simply seems to be to sprint the squadron out of flat range, have a quick coffee break, and then turn back in with about 10 to 12 seconds on the cooldown once you've assessed the situation and decided what your next target's going to be. The rocket planes also have a couple of uh, quirks. Perhaps most obviously, you do not get a patrol fighter consumable. So there's no portable anti-air deterrent to help save those cute destroyers, but let's be honest here, that's not what most people use patrol fighters for. Most CV drivers use them as deployable spotters, be it to mark early targets in the first scouting passes while the main squadron checks the rest of the map, or to keep a hostile, but still cute, destroyer spotted while the rocket planes set up an attack run. This is not an option for FDR's attack planes. And this is where FDR's rocket attack throws a second spanner into the works. 52 rockets, yes, but they're on a somewhat wider ellipse than normal, and they have a very different attack profile. 
rather than diving down to low altitude and launching from a thousand meters or less, the FDR's planes start their run from about four kilometers out and launch at about two to three kilometers in a relatively gentle dive. I remind you that the air spotting radius of a destroyer without active flak is currently about two and a half kilometers. And I remind you again, this squadron cannot deploy a patrol fighter. All of this combines to make attacking a destroyer potentially tricky. If the destroyer has its flak off and there is no friendly to provide spotting, your attack run will be blind until the last few seconds. You can very easily miss entirely if the destroyer isn't exactly where you thought it was going to be. And yes, you do still get hit with that 25 second cooldown if you don't launch your ordnance. In addition, a destroyer that turns into or away from your attack will evade the vast, vast majority of those 52 rockets. So it's not all doom and gloom for an alert and careful destroyer. The oblivious broadside destroyer with its flak on, however, well, enjoy those when they come along. It won't be often. The good news is that it's comparatively easy to land 30 plus rocket hits into a broadside cruiser or battleship, and this usually gets you a fairly reliable 7 to 10,000 damage against even relatively uncooperative targets. The torpedo bombers drop 8 torpedoes per run for a maximum of 33,864 damage before torpedo defences, plus flooding of course. Which sounds great, but yep, you guessed it, there are some catches. The spread is wide enough that even if you're running up against the arming limit, you'll need a target the size of a broadside Yamato or Kerfust to land all 8 torpedoes. Against evading at large targets, you can reasonably expect four to six hits on a good pass, and a bad one is still largely wasted ammo, whilst if you're trying to land torpedoes on cruisers or evasive destroyers, <laughs> good luck. Further complicating the matter is the 25 second cooldown, and not just because of the mathematical limit it imposes on your torpedoes per minute. A common tactic with torpedo bombers is to combine two launches, with the first launch either forcing a target to turn hard and blow its steerage way and thus be an easy mark for the second strike, or else pinning the target onto a particular course and, yep, making it an easier mark for a second strike. The enforced cooldown largely breaks this tactic, since you can't easily overlap two torpedo strikes from the FDR. These are very much a backup weapon. They're great for dealing with battleships or heavily armoured cruisers that are distracted and that the rockets and bombs might have some trouble with. They're also pretty good for combing smoke screens, since you put eight into the water at once. If you need to flush out a Capin destroyer or Royal Navy cruiser, these aren't bad at all. Which leaves the high explosive bombers as the FDR's primary aircraft option. They get the same bomb as the Midway, the A and M66, and they drop eight of these per pass. Rather than a near vertical dive like Midway's BTDs, however, the Sky Pirates come in at about a 30 degree dive, give or take. This does result in a four to five second fall time for the bombs, depending on exactly when you release them. And that in turn translates into a couple of hundred meters lead on most targets. It's nothing to complain about once you're used to it, but it does take a bit of getting used to, and it does make hitting an evading destroyer or small cruiser as much an exercise in luck as judgment. Otherwise, the attack method is more or less the same as the other bombers, and attacks down the length of the ship are preferred thanks to the nature of the roughly battleship-sized ellipse. And yes, the a 66 does still hit like a truck. Which brings us to my overall opinion and the big question. Is the FDR worth the 33,000 steel asking price? The analogy that has repeatedly popped into my head while I've been preparing this review, and also during testing, is that if the other carriers are scalpels meant to provide precision damage against key targets, FDR is something of a sledgehammer. Her planes are slow, and the long cooldown after each attack means that she often feels frustratingly unwieldy. It took a while for me to suppress the instinct to immediately turn into a follow-up attack, like I would with any other carrier. 
On the other hand, the Sky Pirates are so tough that you can, if needed, bulldoze through even moderate flak to deliver a strike, and the sheer amount of ordnance in play means that if you do get a solid run, you'll deliver a blow that most opponents can't ignore. And then, because of the sheer number of aircraft you have in a wing, you can do it again and again and again over the course of two or three minutes. So let's break it down by scenario. 33,000 steel, or more likely 24,750 steel with the 25% voucher factored in. For co-op and possibly scenarios, who knows what the future holds, the answer is very yes. Scenarios, if we ever get a tier 10 scenario, tend to emphasize survivability, and the Sky Pirates bring back to the table in spades, while co-op is largely a damage farming exercise against relatively cooperative targets. Line up on the battleships and let rip. Just remember to leave something for your teammates. Randoms, also yes, but not so emphatically. Once you adjust to the quirks, FDR is capable of doing a significant amount of damage, and the enforced 25 second cooldown can actually mean you run up a lot of spotting damage, whether you mean to or not. It's just a pity the scoring system still doesn't give you much credit for spotting, and your teammates will probably be expecting you to solo hunt the enemy destroyers. As discussed, FDR's planes, at uh, least her rocket planes, are, I suspect deliberately, not that good at solo hunting destroyers. Circling overhead while somebody else does the actual blamming, oh yes, the Sky Pirates can tank even moderate Swedish, or like pan EU, destroyer flak for those critical seconds if they need to. Doing the actual blamming, not so much. On the bright side, at least you're not completely reduced to torpedo strikes like poor old Richthofen. As for ranked and competitive, it depends on the exact rule set, but probably no. I won't say she's worth it here. In competitive play, the carrier's role tends to shift away from more damage to destroyer hunting, scouting, spotting, and rapid response. The problems with using an FDR to hunt destroyers have already been noted. The ability to loiter and spot in a relatively hot area thanks to the large number of planes and their massive health pool also noted, so that is a plus point. The problem with FDR is the slow speed of the planes. They simply do not do rapid response. You cannot dash across the map to plug a suddenly developing hole or a flipping control point. And the business of scouting, searching the map for the enemy, as opposed to keeping them spotted for fire once you've actually found them, is similarly hampered because the slow speed makes it awkward to cover a large area of the map in anything approaching a practical amount of time. There is also some contextual problems to deal with. Most notably, a lot of player-run competitions simply ban carriers outright, and FDR is a steel ship. She's competing with the Stalingrad, which is a mainstay of the competitive seed, and the Summers, which has enjoyed a burst of popularity in the no-carrier metagame, although Smolens come up hard behind her, for your hard-earned steel. And candidly, I would buy the Stalingrad and the Summers first. Stalingrad is rarely a bad choice, no matter what rule set you're playing under, and Summers is having something of a happy time with the current wave of no-carrier rule sets. But as noted, we'll see how long that lasts, given that Smallland seems to be developing flavour of the month at present. Overall, I'm going to put her at a good boat once you're used to her quirks, on Mouse's angry YouTuber scale, shading down to Meboat for competition purposes, and I will probably buy her. Eventually. Once I've got myself a Stalingrad. That has been the FDR, ladies and gentlemen, and I have been useful. Thank you for listening, and of as always, like, subscribe, and follow the socials in the comments if you've enjoyed this review, because Lord knows I need the backup. Until next time, farewell.